broadcasting. So welcome everyone that's uh, joining. Um, so we'll wait uh, as usual. We'll give it uh, we'll give it a minute or two just to allow people to come into the room. So yeah, very pleased to have you all uh, again. I think um, we have a few people from. Uh, from last week as well that's joined so welcome those of you who uh, are joining us again uh, again this week so we're just waiting uh, now for uh, for everyone to to come in and I can see it's uh, rising rapidly again at the bottom so it's great to see so many of you uh, so many of you joining us and again we have uh, attendees from uh, delegates from all over the world again this time right across the the, the world from America to Russia India, uh, several countries um, in uh, in Africa <clears throat> as as well, uh, countries across uh, Europe. So it's it's, it's truly <laughs> a truly international attendance to this. So it just it just goes to show um, how globally uh, applicable uh, these tools are. So um, I'm and absolutely delighted that we are we have got this interest from. Uh, from so many people across uh, across the world, so I can see that the numbers still still rising at the bottom of my screen. So we'll just uh, we'll just give it uh, uh, sort of half a minute longer, just to make sure that uh, everyone who wants to be here at the beginning is here at the beginning. So yes, and given that you're all over uh, from all over the world, you'll be at different times of the day as well. So thank you very <laughs> much, those of you that have got up in the in the middle of the night to to come and listen to us. So we're we're very flattered. Uh, very flattered by that. And those of you, it's uh, it's uh, uh, daytime. I hope it's uh, I hope it's sunny for you where where you are. We're all uh, uh, all of us on the panel. We're uh, all from the uh, sort of dialing in from the UK today. So um, uh, and we're on different parts of the UK. But where I am, it's uh, it's a bit cloudy. Where uh, you're in London, Anna, where what's it like? Yes, for you? it's a bit cloudy with sunny spells coming through. Well, <laughs> so very English summer. English summer, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope we get more uh, more sunny spells as the as the day progresses. Mm -hmm. um, so just before we uh, just before we start, perhaps um, I'll mention uh, a couple of social uh, media handles, etc. Um, so you can uh, follow what Bayfield Training's up to on Twitter with at Bayfield Train. So if you want to jot that down, or if you're on the on the computer, um, Anna is of course from Space Syntax, and Space Syntax Twitter address is at space underscore syntax. That's at, at space underscore syntax. Um, and if you want to follow me, I'm Natalie Bayfield. So at uh, at Natalie Bayfield on Twitter. Okay, so um, it looks like uh, we've got a fairly uh, full room. So uh, welcome, uh, welcome to everyone. Um, so we'll get uh, we'll get started. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I'm delighted uh, uh, to be welcoming Anna again, uh, this week and to be hosting um, uh, a follow on from 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 last week's session that that Anna did. So uh, uh, welcome again, Anna. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great to be back and have the opportunity to talk to you all. Well, it's fantastic. I mean, last week was uh, very popular and I think we got lots of uh, feedback afterwards. So, yeah, delighted to have you here again. I think it's probably worthwhile refreshing everyone as to um, what Space Syntax, uh, what Space Syntax is. So Space Syntax um, is an approach to analysing space that was uh, developed by uh, UCL back um, in the 1970s with some pioneering work then. It was the developed, uh, Space Syntax has been developed into a set of tools and Space Syntax is also a, a commercial spin out of that um, sort of academic research, um, which is what Anna is a, as a director of. So they help people, organisations uh, analyse uh, analyze space. Um, so the session we've got to, today is um, uh, how we use design to influence um, uh, customer experience and, and footfall. So last week we looked very much at the macro level. Um, so we look, watched in amazement as Anna was able to um, <laughs> just pick out streets in a city and tell us what was actually going on at, that, uh, at the macro level. Um, so now we'll look at the place level, at the, at the, um, uh, at the location. 
Um, and before I hand over to Anna, I, I do want to mention that um, these two uh, webinars are an excellent introduction um, to our new course, uh, which is Spatial Layout and, and Retail Performance. And it's a day long course where on the uh, first half of the day, uh, we'll be talking again about how to, to read a, a city um, and uh, understanding the tools to analyze and, and look at dynamics at a city, uh, a city level. Um, and then the second half of the day, uh, we'll uh, look at uh, the tools in detail to analyze um, uh, locations and space and buildings uh, uh, as well. So putting it, uh, putting it all into context. And Anna may mention a bit about that um, at the end as well. Um, last year's, uh, last year's, last week's, <laughs> it feels like years in COVID. Uh, last week's um, uh, webinar is on the space syntax uh, or will be on the space syntax if it's not there already uh, shortly. Um, so, so you can have a look at that. Uh, uh, you can have a look at that in, in full. Um, and uh, yes, we'll, we'll mention a bit more at the, at the end and we'll send a follow up email to those of you who've attended and uh, I think we've got some, um, uh, Sonia's got some extra uh, treats for those who've attended uh, as well. So um, that's all from me, I think. And um, yes, I'll, I'll hand over to Anna. Thank you very much, Natalie. Okay, so um, today's session, Spatial Layout and Retail Performance, is, as Natalie said, an introduction to the course we are uh, developing. And it's really about um, explaining how space syntax tools can help with the understanding of the impact on layout and uh, the impact uh, of layout on human uh, behavior and the experience of places. Um, so we're going to look at different scales of this experience because uh, as a customer arrives in a retail place or environment, they are going to um, have to move through these different scales. So they're arriving in an area and then uh, getting familiar at a kind of, let's say, macro scale uh, and then uh, getting into a place um, up to the point where they engage with an object in the shop. So we can't really separate out these different uh, scales. The other thing is um, that um, we think this is really important in the context of the current um, COVID-19 uh, situation because uh, city centers have to rely on a positive experience um, of their users. Otherwise, it will be very hard for people to actually uh, come to them and feel safe and comfortable and enjoy their experience. And of course, this is very strongly linked to other trends uh, everyone knows about uh, in this domain. Uh, the impact of uh, digital already meant that people would be uh, choosing very carefully where they would spend their time and the experience being ever more important. So um, this webinar will be this introduction to a number of tools I'm going through uh, explaining to you. Um, and how they relate to the human experience. So I'm going to start again with the, um, with the city scale. Um, just a recap from uh, last week's seminar and for those of you who haven't been there. So at the city scale, this is an example of uh, Cardiff. Um, Space Syntax is using something called a segment model. So it's a spatial accessibility model which looks at the spatial hierarchy of the uh, publicly accessible movement network uh, in the city. So we're calculating this uh, measure of spatial accessibility, which is taking each segment and it looks at how is this segment connected to everywhere else? How easy is it to get to everywhere else? So it's a relative um, centrality, let's say, of every place in the city. And uh, this is a very good sort of scan of a location in order to understand what is what we call the location uh, potential of a place in relation to what are the, let's say the main high streets are picked up uh, very well in this measure. But also it's really important uh, at this scale to look at uh, a place. In this case, we're looking at the Cardiff St. David's Center here and how it relates to the much more global access points like uh, railway stations and transport hubs and then also how it relates to the um, areas outside of the city center where you have residential population how are they actually getting into the center so this location 
potential we measure using spatial accessibility. And you can see these black little arrows here. These are locations where we carried out uh, pedestrian movement surveys. So this is about measuring human behavior. Um, so we always look at measuring the qualities of the built environment as well as uh, behavior patterns. And that allows us to build statistical models, which you see on the right, uh, where we uh, correlate um, pedestrian movement um, against spatial accessibility. And typically in well-established urban systems, we get a fairly strong correlation between those two things. So uh, it's a really good basis with relatively little data sources to create a predictive um, movement model. Now, when we look at uh, location in the city, um, what as a design principle, um, Space Syntax and also uh, most of our clients are always looking at creating synergies at the place level between the retail place development and the surrounding context. So we're looking at using these models as predictive tools to understand the impact of different layout um, iterations. And this is what I'm going to show you next. So how you can use this model to simulate a future design. So here you can see uh, if you um, create additional permeability, what would be the impact? How strong would these new alignments be? And also what would be the impact on the surrounding city center? So you can see to the west of the center, uh, the street, previously a sort of yellowish green line turns red. This shows again that you can never look in isolation uh, at a spatial uh, intervention like this. And this is really useful when you talk to other stakeholders, uh, the local authorities, but also other retail stakeholders in the center that you can show them what we're going to do is not just creating competition, let's say. Um, this is actually creating synergies and creating overall a stronger uh, destination. And that should always be the aim for the center on one hand, uh, to be successful, have a strong potential to attract footfall, but also to take advantage of the additionality of the other attractions uh, in the area and creating synergies and a bigger, better um, city center altogether. So as you can imagine, these models are very useful for communicating between different stakeholders. And also, I'm not showing this now, in the course we will be able to look at for example, um, looking at lots of different iterations or options, which is a typical design process uh, uh, in projects uh, like this. We're also going to be able to look at uh, many more case studies than we're able uh, in this webinar. Um, so, but what about a situation where you um, have a much more isolated um, place? Um, this is a shopping center. Um, um, outside of Bergen in uh, Norway. Uh, it's called Strauma Center and it's one of these early shopping centers which over time had many additions to it and almost grew organically uh, over many uh, decades. Um, what is happening now, we're not going to show this right now, um, but what's happening now to this center, this uh, formerly um, very rural area has uh, been uh, becoming a suburban area. Um, and now um, the city wants to turn this into, a, uh, into the city center. So what's happening is that uh, there's a lot of uh, development, a uh, lot of other functions um, uh, around this center and they're trying to embed this into a public realm outside in indoor and outdoor spaces, uh, as well as more development, uh, a bigger mix of uses supporting, which is also good for the for the retail function, of course. Um, but what I'm focusing on uh, in this slide is a different uh, methodology we are using when we're looking at a kind of smaller scale. So you see, this is not a, a segment based model. This is more like a heat map. And this is uh, what we call strategic visibility analysis. And this is another method we're going to talk about in more detail uh, in the course. Um, and what it does, it instead of line segments, we have a grid of cells 
uh, across the publicly accessible areas and the computer calculates for each cell how visible is it in relation to everywhere else in the center. So it's a, what we call visual exposure. It's not just um, the size of the visual field from everywhere in the center. It's um, not just about what you see, but uh, how well visually connected are the places you can see. Again, it's a relative visual accessibility uh, value. That's why we call it strategic visibility. And typically what um, shopping center or retail um, clients want to achieve is a relatively even distribution of the visual exposure. So we know that uh, visual exposure attracts people. So people like to go where they can see. That seems to be the experience when we again correlate these values against human behavior. Um, so what we try to do is uh, understand these patterns and you can relate them to the actual commercial performance uh, of the center. So the right image is actually uh, plotting rent levels. So it's a proxy for the uh, commercial performance. Um, so we can see relationships between the blue areas uh, in the commercial performance and in the spatial uh, accessibility. You, you see sort of various degrees of uh, commercial uh, uh, parameters and, and visibility parameters. So then we think about, okay, what could we do in this case? They're going through a stage of redevelopment. They want to make some quite significant spatial changes, but in particular in terms of this visual exposure, what can we do uh, to even it out more? And then again, we can use this as a simulation tool and just experiment with some fairly minor changes um, of removing some of the kind of visual blockages in certain spaces can see can have a quite profound impact on, um, on the overall distribution of visual exposure of shop fronts, uh, new lines of sight uh, being possible. And again, this is very useful before you do something to just reassure yourself uh, or the design team, the client team, um, what would be um, the impact. And in the course, we're going to explain in more detail there are a number of different measures you can use using strategic uh, visibility analysis. And uh, this will be part of the, the, the one day course uh, where we're going to look at what we can do with this in more detail. Um, now, um, we have another methodology, which is a, an agent based uh, model. This is typically used at a kind of very detailed level of design um, because it helps us to predict almost like individual people's um, behaviors. Um, and this is um, an example of a department store uh, ground floor. So inside a shop, let's say, uh, a very detailed environment. Um, it's uh, related to where do we place objects in space um, for example, different concessions on the ground floor of a, a department store. Um, in gray, you see all the sort of back of house areas here uh, with great visual uh, barriers for people. And you see there's almost sort of a grid of a movement structure here. Uh, but you also see that within that grid, there will be these more quiet areas. And this is really important, again, about the experience to understand that um, footfall Everyone wants footfall in retail, obviously. Um, however, there's also such a thing as too much footfall, depending on the type of retail and the type of experience you want to create. So for example, if you uh, want to sell a very expensive watch to someone, uh, you might want to um, create a more private environment, a more calm environment um, for that transaction. Um, so you would place that perhaps somewhere in this area as opposed to in this central area which would attract a, a lot of um, activity um, and um, what you see on the left again is um, a survey of actual pedestrian traces this is also a methodology we're using in when we look at things like museums and galleries um, so we look at actual if it's an existing place actual human behavior patterns again we use that to sort of sense check our, our models. Um, 
and we see these uh, relationships between human behavior and um, the analysis. Now this agent modeling analysis um, works uh, similar to many sort of uh, crowd modeling software people might be familiar with, but there's an important distinction. So typically with agent modeling, you would work with a, with a matrix with a lot of assumptions about origins and destinations um, of these agents. So you come up with a sort of scenario, let's say, of how people might be behaving. And then you ask the computer to run this scenario to see the cumulative pattern emerging from the scenario. And then it highlights bottlenecks and, uh, and issues and opportunities, um, which help you to adjust uh, your design. Um, our agents, they are informed uh, by origins and destinations, like uh, typical software is. Um, but also they have the information of the visibility graph analysis. So we uh, say, like to say they are spatially or visually intelligent. So the information of where they want to go to is combined with the information what they can see as they move around. So every sort of, sort of certain number of steps, they get this information and they're thinking about sort of the end destination, what they see and that combination um, creates a route which is um, more informed by the sort of visual information of their spatial environment. And we find that this correlates very well to actual human uh, behavior um, through uh, the studies where we correlated that uh, against human behavior. Um, yeah, so um, this is about a quite detailed experience. Could help you, for example, make decisions about where you place different kind of retail, but also things like where you put vertical circulation elements, like the access to an escalator, um, where would you put um, information, signage in strategic uh, locations. And it might help you to identify there's a bottleneck here or there's a kind of pinch point. Uh, I want to do something about this to create a more generous experience. Again, extremely important um, during our time now, uh, where it's extremely important that people, when they enter a store, they uh, come, in, come in and they feel like um, they're comfortable, they're safe, they're not going to end up in a crowd uh, sudden, suddenly. Okay, um, so, so I've been going through these different scales and the different methodologies we can combine. Um, because again, as I said at the beginning, um, we can't really separate them. As a human being, you, you have to negotiate these different scales uh, of your environment and you can't really separate them out. And even at the very local um, situation, you're always aware of your wider uh, context. And um, depending on the project and the stage of the development, we might start working on the kind of more strategic analysis of a place. This is again the Strauma Center, but at a more strategic level using the um, uh, spatial accessibility segment model and looking at how it's uh, integrating with, here you see the new development I've been talking about, the new kind of office and residential buildings and how they're going to link into the existing center. Um, always uh, looking at actual behavior in order to be able to create statistical predictive models for the design and impact uh, assessments. Um, if available, or ideally if available, we uh, look at the retail performance at a commercial level. This is a shopping center in Japan we did some work on. Um, so again, we can not only look at footfall, but the likely impact on what we like to call place value. And um, this is also extremely useful if you are a retailer, um, a landlord, um, and you want to discuss um, future rents, um, uh, tenancy agreements. Um, so for example, we're working on projects which are completely isolated, especially, or uh, projects which are in former brownfield sites, let's say. So there hasn't been anything before. Um, so how does a restaurant owner or a shop owner assess 
what is going to be the likely footfall if that location uh, basically didn't exist before. So these models um, are very useful in uh, those sort of negotiations and understanding what to expect in a, let's say, future place which didn't exist uh, before. And then down to, you know, optimizing, this is the cool drops uh, yard in King's Cross uh, circulation uh, patterns and infrastructure location of vertical uh, access points. So this is looking at the three levels and how they how they connect it um, and what is the, going to be the hierarchy of the kind of uh, pedestrian flows or you could also look at, for example, landscaping of open spaces um, in uh, retail uh, developments and then down to uh, inside the shop um, placement of uh, objects. Um, yeah, so I think this is a good overview of the kinds of uh, methods and tools. We're going to talk in more detail uh, at the course. And um, I think my time is uh, over and I need to hand over again to Natalie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. And I mean, I think really what fascinates me about this, all of this, is that you can actually um, look at the uh, model and, and analyse design changes without actually going to the capital expenditure of and the non-reversible actual design, you know, and, and building of, of extensions and, um, and redesigning spaces. Um, I'd like to um, open it up to questions. So if anybody has got any questions, then um, yeah, feel free. So we've got a few, we've got a few minutes uh, for, we've got five, 10 minutes for that. Mm -hmm. So use the Q&A box at the, at the bottom if you, uh, if you want to ask any questions. But whilst we're uh, waiting uh, for some questions to, to come through, I didn't mention at the beginning, so that's perhaps why they've, uh, they've, they've not come through just yet. We had quite, we had quite a lot last, <laughs> last week, didn't we? <laughs> Um, so perhaps I could kick off with a with a question. I, I, I mentioned a couple of times that um, you, you shouldn't really implement anything or nothing really works in isolation. But do you have a view of um, perhaps what's more important, the macro scale or the micro scale, for example, if the, the macro um, spatial layout of a city mm. or whatever is, um, is not working or not ideal, is there anything you can do at the micro level um, that will help or is it hopeless? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the most important thing is um, if you, let's say you have a spatially high, highly isolated development, um, you need to convince people to come there in the first place. So I think uh, what is important, what we call the attractor effect. Um, so if it is something very special, um, people cannot have this anywhere else <laughs> and it has a high attraction to them, they will decide to come there. Um, but that relies on, on things like, uh, um, like brand, value and uh, things which are outside of let's say the space syntax um, field um, and um, but once they're there um, you want to optimize uh, that location the danger with this approach is also that um, this attraction might be very relevant right now but what about in 10 years so sometimes we work on master plans and we have a very segregated part of the master plan and the design team says, yeah, but we're going to put a, um, a multiplex cinema here and lots of people are going to come here uh, because of this big attraction. And what we say to them is, okay, that's fine um, as long as this works, but what about in maybe in 10 years, no one is coming to cinema anymore. Maybe, you know, there's, there's completely different trends. And what are you going to do with this part then? So what we always try to encourage is think about in the really long term. And if you create a, a more evenly distributed spatial structure, which is, uh, let's say, resilient and uh, suitable for lots of different users, it will be more resilient and sustainable in the long term because you don't have to rely on very specific uh, pull effects, which might exist right now, but not in the future. So if you go with a, a good spatial structure, which will be successful in the long term for lots of different things, you're more resilient. 
And I suppose some um, cities um, change over time, like you mentioned in, in Bergen uh, as well. So um, is there a, a, a case for doing this uh, kind of analysis on a regular basis? I mean, is it, um, is it sort of costly and involved to do, or is there a case for saying, yeah, let's, let's, let's check that this is working on a, on a <laughs> yearly basis, for example, by using these tools? Yeah, maybe yearly basis is uh, not necessary, but what, I mean, we do have models of most major UK cities um, because of the, the, you know, all the projects we've been working on over the years. Um, however, whenever we work on a new project and come back to a place, we check the model and look for recent developments which uh, might have changed the spatial uh, context. So you have to do that. And the other thing we, we have to do is we need to look at the future development scenario. So we can't just look at our site in isolation and say, okay, what happens if we do this? We always need to look at all the planning applications and committed developments. And we always have a discussion with the design and client team. What should be the assumptions for the future scenario when this is built out? What else is, has ha would have happened in the meantime? in the in the wider context which will impact on 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 the place itself so that's interesting as well to pick up on that point that you know you've you've been doing this for quite a, a long time so you do actually have a lot of uh, case studies so you're not always looking at a place fresh um, you do have a lot yeah. of data um, across the across the uk um, and i think you mentioned last week that you have a, a tool that looks at um, uh, sort of a higher level across the, the the uk that anybody could access yes so we have uh, if you google space syntax open mapping you find a map of all of the uk um, and a number of pre-processed measures you can have a look at your place um, however, it's a quite strategic model, so it doesn't have all the detail of every single pedestrian link, but it's a good uh, starting point. Um, we're also looking at a model um, which uh, looks also at other kind of data. So we call this an integrated urban model where we're looking at uh, land use and the spatial model and that relationship. Um, that's something we're going to launch uh, in the future. Um, but what we also have is uh, we have a huge database of pedestrian movement uh, data at this sort of uh, level of detail of locations. Um, so um, at the moment, it's a, a difficult thing uh, to do any new service because uh, of COVID-19, all the um, movement patterns are uh, distorted and not really uh, normal so we can fall back on some of the data we collected in previous years um, if it's not too old and if we have some control uh, locations uh, in more recent times we can then at least look at the patterns of the data and extrapolate um, you know using population growth assumptions and things like this so uh, one of the advantages of this modeling is also that when you link it to, let's say, population data, square footage of development and so on, you can build models without having to rely on, uh, on pedestrian movement data. Yes, yeah, so you don't actually, I mean, that's the real value of, um, of, of your techniques is that you can use these mathematical uh, models in the absence of people in city centres, which um, we're experiencing uniquely right, uh, yeah. uniquely right now. So, um, yeah, more valuable than, than ever. Uh, we do have a question um, from Yusuf in, uh, if, I've, if I've pronounced your name correctly, so do, do, uh, I do apologise if I haven't. Uh, he's from uh, Algeria um, and he wanted to ask about the techniques of survey. Um, are photo snapshots relevant in behavioural surveys in urban spaces? Mm -hmm. What is the difference between snapshots and gate count techniques? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I presume that's uh, about the, the, the surveys to back up your, um, your kind of mathematical approach, I, I, I guess yeah. you would use these techniques just to check that what your analysis is, yeah. is, um, yeah. is correct. Yeah, there, there are three uh, different types of surveys typically. So the most common one we call the gate counts. So basically uh, here we're collecting flows, uh, typically in a kind of 
reasonably busy area, we would count every hour for 10 minutes how many people are passing uh, through a location. And you can see often we look at both sides of the pavement separately um, because often we also look at things like should there be a new pedestrian crossing somewhere, uh, you know, in, in order to facilitate easier movement into a, a location. So that's the, the gate counts. Um, what you see here on the right, this is pedestrian traces. This is Buchanan galleries in Glasgow. So we looked at the different entrances and just follow people for a certain amount of time and see what their, what their routes are. Um, so this, these are manually uh, traced uh, people. So we're looking into ways of, you know, using technology, Bluetooth thickness and things like that. But um, uh, if you want to get a kind of complete picture, it's uh, still necessary to, to, to have uh, either video surveys or uh, things like that. Um, and the third one is the snapshots. And I think we've seen this, uh, you know, you see the yellow dots um, in this survey. Um, basically what you do in time intervals, you go through different spaces. You take a literal snapshot, not necessarily by taking a photograph, but by putting dots on a, on a map uh, on your flip chart. Um, and that we do in order to record what we call stationary activity, because we're very interested in which places people like to stop. Um, and, you know, we might be uh, marking here, the blue circles are marking people who are interacting with each other. And this is something we, for example, also do in public spaces or in office uh, environments where we're interested in communication uh, patterns. So these are the main sort of survey techniques we are using, but depending on a specific project and research question, we might also invent uh, others. Well, it certainly sounds um, very thorough. So uh, with your analytical techniques that you've developed over the, over the last few decades, you're checking them uh, against real numbers on every single, uh, every single project. So um, yeah, your, your database must be uh, huge and heaving with, uh, with all the information. Um, I think that's probably all we've got time for, for um, questions, but um, I just want to uh, mention a couple of things if I may, on the last slide, um, just to, if you want to find out more about this, um, very shortly coming up is um, the uh, course on spatial layout and retail performance, where um, we will go through all of this uh, in a lot more detail. Um, so you can actually go away really understanding these tools and how these tools work. And um, I believe at Space Syntax, they'll give you access to uh, tools and show you where to uh, find information and 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 do some analysis so i think it it really is um kind of essential for anyone who's um looking at uh, regenerating uh, city centers or um looking at shopping centers it's um you know it, especially right now um you know it's uh, when we can't actually get this empirical uh, data quite so easily or empirical data is um you know it, it is fluctuating then then this the, these tools, these analytical techniques um, really, uh, really do serve a purpose. Um, Sonia, I believe, is will be sending everybody out who has attended this uh, uh, webinar with some uh, with some, uh, some special treats. I, I, I think there'll be a, uh, a discount, if you like, on, um, uh, on, the, on the course that's coming up. So I do encourage you to look at that um, and you can find that and details of all of our other courses um, on the uh, website at Bayfield, uh, Bayfield Training. Last year's, uh, last, I keep saying last year just because <laughs> <laughs> COVID seems so long, um, but last week's um, webinar is uh, also on the Space Syntax um, uh, site, uh, which I think there's details in the chat of that. Remember also, uh, we do webinars every week at the moment. We've been doing webinars for two uh, years on, on real estate. Um, so if you want to attend uh, any of our webinars, if you attend five of them, uh, you can come on one of the uh, courses Spatial layouts and retail performance uh, would be a good one to use that discount on of, uh, of 20%. But as I say, anyone who's attended this webinar um, will also uh, get some uh, special offers and treats and bits and pieces from, uh, from Sonia as well. Um, is there anything you wanted to finish off with, Anna, to say about the course or anything else you wanted to, to finish with? Um, 
No, I think um, the most important thing is that with the planning of uh, environments at the moment uh, more than ever is to put the human experience at the heart of it. And that's what we're trying to do um, with uh, the way we have developed our methodologies and uh, tools. And uh, yeah, I, I, I attended a webinar um, yesterday, which the famous Bill Grimsey was up and he was sort of expressing his his passionate passion to seize the opportunity, this opportunity to reshape city centres. Um, so um, yeah, what better than to have, you know, some real tools, real analytics to, to enable you to, to move forward for that. So I hope we'll see you all again at our other webinars and uh, at our upcoming courses. Um, do check out the tools that they've uh, that Space Syntax have put in the, the chat. We'll follow up with uh, emails um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you very much again, Anna. Um, and yeah, see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>